So I read last week that the mayor of Madrid uh, wants to ban all protest in the center of the Spanish capital. Uh, anyone who has traveled to Spain in recent years has come across protesters in public places like the Plaza de Catalunya in Barcelona, where, as you see here, uh, where a village sprang up after the Spanish economy collapsed, akin to the one in New York's Zuccotti Park. Last month, tens of thousands of demonstrators took over uh, Cologne Square in Madrid, rallying uh, against continuing unemployment and EU-related austerity measures. And then during the night, some protesters clashed with police. So the mayor, who earlier this year cracked down on buskers, provoking a wave of populist outrage and mockery on YouTube, petitioned the national government to prevent all gatherings in central Madrid at a time when the city needs to attract tourism and investment, she said, demonstrations, quote, undermine the city's image. I would say the reverse is true. They prove the vitality and resilience of the Spanish. In any case, we see the unfolding consequences of occupation in Kiev, where demonstrators took over Independence Square, and the reverberations from Tahrir uh, now include the death sentences handed down by a judge in March uh, on 529 Egyptians associated with the deposed Muslim Brotherhood, uh, who were accused of attacking a police station in Minya, where uh, an officer was killed last August. And there we are in Tahrir. As for Istanbul, uh, last summer's occupation of Gezi Park in Taksim Square, as Gary said, I went to watch it, um, and the crackdown by government forces emboldened opponents of Prime Minister Erdogan to pursue corruption charges against him. In response, Erdogan last month blocked Twitter and YouTube to prevent the sharing of what he has called false allegations of corruption and wrongdoing. Local elections just the other day, a couple days ago, uh, provided a vote of confidence for Erdogan, who used victory to threaten mass arrests of detractors and encouraged his enemies to flee the country. Clearly, the protests in Gezi had a point about threatened freedoms. Erdogan speaks for Turkey's religious conservatives who constitute roughly half, maybe a little more than half, uh, of the country, many of whom felt themselves marginalized under Turkey's secular rulers. Gezi, like other public spaces for protest, became a kind of crucible for dissent, forging this alliance of diverse opponents, urban intellectuals, secular-minded Turks, nationalists, all of whom, in a sense, discovered each other and their shared grievances on the common ground of the park. I want to unpack some notions about public space today, its design and uses, a topic of widespread discussion lately. I will first state the obvious about the body politic, then when we talk about the politics of public space, we are talking both about space and bodies, about the physical presence of bodies occupying space, which is inseparable from and constantly reformed by the interactions of those bodies. Spaces are not fixed, they constantly change. I want to look at specific public spaces occupied by protesters like Zuccotti and Gezi, but then to broaden the discussion to include public space more generally, because when we talk about politics and public space, we miss the point if we limit ourselves to sites of protest. So my main focus will turn to projects in Egypt, Venezuela, and the West Bank. Asked about the deaths of migrant workers uh, c uh, constructing a stadium in Qatar, about 832 Nepalese and Indian workers uh, have been killed so far working on World Cup construction sites. Um, a well-known architect uh, was recently quoted as saying, I have nothing to do with the workers. It is not my duty as an architect to look at it. Um, her partner then denounced, quote, moralizing political correctness, saying it, quote, is trying to paralyze us with bad conscience and arrest our explorations if we cannot demonstrate a manifest, tangible benefit to the poor, as if the delivery of social justice is the architect's competency. So I sort of added earlier that the spaces we design are shaped not just by the bodies that use them, but also the ones that build them. And I'm grateful for these unfortunate remarks by the architects because they help to accelerate a timely conversation. There's a dialectic undercurrent that runs throughout this talk between design and adaptation intention and improvisation, control and formlessness, 
engagement, and isolation. Architects don't act alone, but neither must they be passive. And I see here a rich and promising vein for architects today who want to reclaim architecture's place at the decision-making table, to return it to the center of discussions about how we live and who we wish to be as a society, and not only make formally and materially pioneering buildings. Clearly, we can't say that protesters taking to the streets or taking over public space is anything new. I'm sorry, those are the migrant workers. This is Prague. It's nothing new, but awareness of urban public space has grown. Awareness on a governmental as well as a populist level of its meaning and use in a democratic society, of the relationship of design to issues like public health, safety, social equity, and civic identity. The relationship is asynchronous but determinative between demands for public space and for democracy. When we talk about politics and public space, we should begin with the given that politics, as Judith Butler has put it, already exists, quote, in the home or on the street or in the neighborhood or indeed in those virtual spaces that are equally unbound by the architecture of the house and the square. Close quote. Officials, architects, and planners design public space to serve certain functions or prevent others. This is itself a political act. I show you here a design for Ground Zero, uh, the new World Trade Center. That's how you will be able to drive in and out of the new supposedly open streets that have been created in the, uh, around the new buildings at the World Trade Center. But then what happens when people use the space is that other politics are enacted. It is this enactment by changing configurations of bodies and interests within the space that makes architecture inseparable from politics. Space is a container but also a stage for action. As Hannah Arendt said, political action requires a space of appearance and a true polis is, quote, the organization of the people as it arises out of acting and speaking together. That is, a polis expresses itself through the interaction of people in a place. It is at once the place and the people. She added, quote, its true space lies between people living together for this purpose. So politics, you might say, happen more specifically in the spaces between us, which concentrate in public space. As I said about Gezi, public spaces make visible to the world people who might otherwise remain visible, invisible, to each other. But to gain attention, the act of occupation requires disrupting spaces designed and maintained for other purposes. This is a picture of Zuccotti, and you can see in it the uh, various um, areas that were set aside. It looks chaotic, but there's a tent area, there's a media area, there's a library, none of which, of course, were authorized by the people who designed the park. This challenges authority public space functioning as both the object of that challenge and the instrument of protest. The challenge may be as benign as sleeping in a square or holding up a banner. Whatever it is, it questions territoriality. Territory is not ground or terrain, nor is it a given, Saskia Sasson has written. It is a complex capability with embedded logics of power and reclamation. So for Sasson, protests like the ones in Tahrir Square or Zuccotti Park cast into doubt what she calls the larger, quote, binary of national versus global, by which modernity has formulated its political structures. Quote, to occupy these spaces, she writes, is to remake their territoriality and thereby their embedded logics of power by introducing logics of sharing and solidarity. So occupation redefines a space whose underlying logic it interrogates. Bodies and space together. Crucially, this combination implies physical sacrifice and risk. Today, the media, including social media, broadcast protests in real time around the world. The 24-hour news cycle, Facebook, Twitter, feed the global public's appetite for drama and the expectation of bearing witness to anything and everything instantly from a safe distance. Facebook and Twitter can call people to arms and like telephones, I'm sorry, television and smartphones, keep an eye on what's happening so the authorities may think twice about cracking down violently on protesters. It's not a coincidence that Turkish police who fired tear gas in Gezi Park were 
for a while chastened by worldwide broadcast critical of their actions, while in Turkish cities that were off the media's radar where protesters also gathered, the, pol the police felt no such constraints. So there's a symbiotic relationship. Protesters count on their being witnessed remotely in virtual space, but it is only real bodies in real space that occupy a real physical site which provides the necessary drama of that occupation. To quote Butler again, quote, the media requires these bodies on the street to have an event, even as those bodies on the street require the media to exist in a global arena. If this conjuncture of street and media constitutes a very contemporary version of the uh, public sphere, then bodies on the line have to be thought of as both there and here, now and then, transported and stationary, with very different political consequences following from these two modalities of space and time. Of course, it also matters not just that spaces be physically occupied, but which spaces are occupied and how, which buildings, squares, by how many people and whom. The protests in Gezi, Tahrir, the Plaza de Catalunya, and at Zuccotti Park share certain telltale traits. This is the Plaza de Catalunya. All of these spaces were the consequence of urban modernization programs. All of them are spaces surrounded by buildings. All are contained and concentrated but porous spaces. Tahrir and the Plaza de Catalunya are traffic hubs. Um, Tahrir really is a traffic circle. And the plaza has a park, as you see here at its center. But there's an enormous amount of bus and other traffic that runs around it. And the plaza has a park at its center as I said, a condition akin to Gezi, which is a scruffy little park within Taksim Square, itself enclosed by streets and uh, mostly modern hotels and other buildings. I'm sorry this slide is so hard to read, but this is, this is Gezi, and this is the square itself of Taksim. And we'll get back to this, but this is what Erdogan planned to, re this is the original Ottoman barracks that was on the site of Gezi, and here's the plan he had for tearing down Gezi and replacing it with new, uh, a, basically a shopping mall that would have been in the form of the old Ottoman barracks. <clears throat> so let's focus though on Zuccotti. Um, it's a theater in the round effect. It's, it's a mostly concrete rectangular plaza, uh, typically used by office workers to eat lunch, bounded by streets and tall buildings. So. Uh, here you see Broadway on this side, Trinity Street, Cedar, and Liberty. And so the streets are all around, and here are the big buildings on either side. I'll show you a map in a moment. Maybe many of you know it. Um, and uh, so it's bounded, as I said, and it means that a few hundred people can make it look crowded, and more people can watch it or watch what's happening inside it from both uh, the sidelines and above. It was not until 2011 a site for protesters. There are hundreds of rallies and protests in New York every year. I found out last week that the Parks Department issued some 250 permits for rallies and vigils last year, most of them for Dog Hammarskjöld Plaza near the UN, or Union Square, Washington Square Park, uh, Thomas Paine Plaza near the federal courts as well. Zuccotti was a kind of serendipitous choice. Protesters had wanted to occupy Wall Street but the police prevented them. So they set up camp three blocks north in a park next door to the World Trade Center site. I'm sorry, let me go back to this just to point out. <clears throat> this is a kind of map of the layout of where, how the protesters um, uh, arranged the park, rearranged the park for their occupation. May I just ask how many people were at Zuccotti or s saw the site? So a fair number. Um, uh, but there were all these uh, areas of food uh, delivery, really free food, media centers was called library. Um, much of the uh, observing crowd was here. The World Trade Center is going to be that way. I'll get back to that issue in a moment. Um, and just to show you again, so here, if I can find it, here's Zuccotti. Here's Wall Street. So they went two blocks north. This is the World Trade Site right here. So it's around the corner from those two. <coughs> um, and this was not a public park, but one of the city's so-called privately owned public spaces. 
U.S. Steel, the original owner, built the park in 1968 in return for the right to add additional floors to its office building on the north side of the park. A citywide program created similar quasi-public spaces by granting private developers exemptions to zoning restrictions. Mostly developers created barren plazas, which we all know, in return for these bonuses, purposely undesirable and poorly maintained because they didn't actually want anybody to gather in front of their buildings. Zuccotti, a step up design-wise, from the earliest plazas, was originally called Liberty Plaza Park, and it became a popular spot in warm weather after an $8 million renovation following 9-11, when it was renamed Zuccotti Park by its new owner, Brookfield Properties. Precisely because the park, and here you see it on a normal day, because, because the park was not public, it was not subject to the rules that govern public parks, like the prohibition against sleeping overnight. I just want to show you here, I took a photograph of this um, not so long ago. This was the original um, s sign that told you what you could not do in Zuccotti Park. And this is why people could settle in Zuccotti Park. These are the things you couldn't do. You couldn't roller skate, you couldn't skateboard, roller skate, or bicycle. That's a short list. This is now a list of the things you can no longer do in Zuccotti Park. It's small print, that's why you always have to read the small print, and suffice it to say, you can't put up a tent, you can't lie down, you can't sit for a long period of time, you can't put your bags down unless you, you, they're right here, they can't block anything. In other words, you can't sit in Zuccotti Park anymore and stage a protest. So, but because it had not had those restrictions, it was, of course, a place, paradoxically, that people could occupy, unlike a public park which closes at night. So it became, in a sense, Occupy's site by default. The irony that Occupy could only occupy a public space because it actually took over a private one, built by U.S. Steel, and then owned by a big commercial real estate company, no less. This was lost on no one. But just as important was how that space was occupied. Its renovation a decade ago added these trees and seating, which you've seen, which provided cover and divided the space up in ways the protesters capitalized on. Imagine Zuccotti Park, one protester told me, as the intersecting point on a Venn diagram of characters representing disparate political and economic disenchantments. And I don't think it's coincidental that these strangers who came together at Zuccotti, as well as in Gezi and elsewhere, all formed pop-up towns on these sites in producing a kind of bite-sized form, so long as they lasted, of what they imagined to be the outlines of a larger, equitable city, with separate spaces for free food, legal services, libraries, medical stations, and so forth. Aristotle talked about the ideal polis extending the distance of a herald's cry, a space in which people communicated face to face. <clears throat> Couldn't resist, sorry. Here again, the politicized shifting space between bodies. And it was meaningful that Zuccotti, <clears throat> using microphones to address the crowd, uh, I'm sorry, that in Zuccotti um, being a contained space, um, allowed protesters who were prevented by the police from using microphones to address the crowd, uh, repeated phrases, phrase by phrase, um, that the speakers uh, at the park um, uttered, so that speeches um, could be heard farther away. So as it were, everyone spoke in one voice, playing this game of telephone. The same crowd, of course, would have looked very puny in Central Park, and there would have been no one around to notice it. Similarly, Gezi Park had not been on um, many people's radar uh, before. It's a kind of shambolic, modestly used green space, popular for yoga classes and sleeping off a hard night in Toxham Squares. Um, that was beforehand. But it turned out to be, like Zuccotti, a meaningful site. It's on the edge of Toxim, which is a very fluid, irregular, open, unpredictable place, reflecting the area's historic identity at the heart of modern, multicultural Turkey. This was where poor European immigrants settled during the 19th century. It was a honky-tonk quarter during the 1980s, a haven to gays and lesbians, a locus for nightclubs, foreign movie palaces and French-style covered arcades. There's a university nearby. It's where young people and tourists congregate at night. Gravestones from an Armenian cemetery toxin were said to have been demolished in 1939 and used to construct stairs at Gezi, which was 
a Republican-era project by the French planner Henri Prost that brought modernism to Istanbul's heart and into the urban fabric, as it did the jumble of high-rise hotels and the now shuttered opera house that surround the park. All this, of course, was precisely what Prime Minister Erdogan didn't like, and he triggered the protest by threatening to demolish and then remake Taksim as a neo-Ottoman theme park. And that's a slightly clearer version of what I was saying before. Getting rid of Gezi and undoing what several Turks described to me as their, quote, unruly commons in the middle of the city. Never mind that there's precious little public green space in the center of Istanbul. The fact that Gezi was an informal and unpredictable place made it suspicious to Erdogan and a natural center of gravity for protesters. As at Zuccotti, its compact design, surrounded by streets with shabby alleys and walkways dividing modest lawns and disused fountains, turned out to be ready-made for the hodgepodge of services, encampments, gardening efforts, and food stalls that divvied up the occupation site. There was some creative use made of cheap materials to provide specific areas for picnic tables, exhibition spaces, and something called the Revolutionary Museum, a pop-up gallery that chronicled the history of Turkish protest, providing the protesters with instant bona fides. One Turk told me, Turkish people who have taken over Gezi Park in protest feel it is truly theirs, not something awarded to them by their leaders. This is critical, I think. The notion of top-down versus bottom-up public space, spaces people are given and passively use versus spaces they remake for themselves. I want to turn from occupation because we need to define public space more broadly. It is not just an area of protest. It encompasses the entirety of the public realm that we build. And politics are no less present when this realm constitutes sidewalks, transit stations, streets, highways, bike paths, and playgrounds where daily life happens in public. Our very definition of public, of democracy, is tested by the distribution, design, and use of these spaces. Who controls these spaces, shapes them, and what do their physical properties say about us. This, by the way, is a view of um, the plaza uh, at Madison Square Park in New York. I'll just, I'll just interrupt myself to tell you very briefly, it's an interesting place. It's where Fifth Avenue and Broadway cross, as you may remember, around 23rd Street. And there's Madison Square Park. And then there are these um, triangles. There's a triangle created by that um, crossing. And um, one of the early things that the Bloomberg administration's uh, transportation department proposed was to uh, turn that triangle and part of the crossing and much of Broadway into a pedestrian plaza. And Michael Beirut, who's an extraordinary designer for a firm called Pentagram, has his office right there. And even he said, this is completely insane. I mean, you have one of the most beautiful parks in the city. Who in the world is going to want to sit in the middle of the street. You're taking over the middle of the street, and why were they going to sit in the street when they can just go sit in the park? This is crazy. And of course, this has turned out to be one of the great urban renewal uh, projects in, in Manhattan. Why do people want to sit in the street? <laughs> because one wants to, because being in a park is a different thing than being in a plaza, right? A park is an enclosed space. Usually, you go into it. A plaza is continuous, usually, with the rest of the city. And People want to be in the plaza because they want to be in the middle of things. They want to be in the middle of the street, where they can have views of the Empire State Building and the Flatiron Building and where there's a lot of things happening. And it turns out that we can reclaim these spaces where people used to actually move a lot more freely uh, before they were given over to cars uh, if we look at the street as another kind of public space and not just a space taken over by cars. Anyway, this is one of, this is one of the plazas that are at Madison Square uh, that's been converted. Every, de every definition of public, of democracy, I think, is tested by the distribution, design, and use of these spaces. Who controls these spaces, shapes them, and what do their physical properties say about us? Such questions have been, of course, at the heart of this larger critique of neoliberal values whose bankruptcy provoked the market collapse that helped inspire the Occupy movement. The 1% is epitomized these days by the $90 million apartments in uh, the skyscrapers around uh, now, rising around New York's most cherished public site, um, Central Park, leveraging views of that park while casting shadows onto it, 
and on the people who use it. This is a picture of um, what's called 157. It's the first of what are going to be many uh, extremely tall luxury towers that are rising around 57th Street. Um, this will be the puniest of them. It's, it's a thousand feet tall. Most of the others are about 14 to 1500 feet tall. Um, so as tall as the World Trade uh, Center, one World Trade Center. Um, and somehow some crazy people actually paid $90 million to get the penthouses in this spectacularly ugly building, um, which is a mystery to almost everybody. But there you are. Wealth has its own ways. And these are some of the buildings that will rise around Central Park, um, just to give you an idea of what, uh, of what has happened to uh, development in the city, partly for reasons that are technological, the ability to uh, create very slender buildings which, uh, with um, elevators and uh, stairs that can take up very little space and get people very quickly uh, up to the tops of these buildings. Um, the zoning rules, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds here, but it is kind of interesting, the relationship of architecture, zoning, and public health in that um, the, the, basically these buildings have happened, and as of right, that is without having to get a, even city approval, because developers had bought a lot of different related plots added up the air rights from all of them, which you can do, and created this extra tall building. Well, nobody imagined you would be able to create a building that was 1,500 feet high with a one apartment on each floor, because it would have made no economic sense, unless you have what has happened now in our neoliberal culture, that you have people who are perfectly happy to pay $100 million for an apartment. So the economy has made that possible, and then the technology of the buildings and the engineering of the buildings has conspired to make that possible. So. That's what's happening. I think it's interesting because, it, as I said, leverage is a public space, Central Park, which is what they're essentially selling in these properties, the view over the park. 57th Street, as you know, is not in itself a fantastically wonderful place to live. And I think the privileging of private property, the reshuffling of public resources to accommodate this private wealth, these kind of neoliberal shibboleths cast a spotlight on public space. Even a generation or two ago, Richard Sennett noted the assumption was, he said, quote, the assumption was not widely made that streets were public space. It was space you moved through and only poor people dwelt in the street, Richard says. I don't think that's quite true, but we overestimate the perspective of Jane Jacobs, who extrapolated theories about design and public space from living in the West Village. <clears throat> that's Jane Jacobs riding on a bicycle, uh, where I happen to grow up, in the West Village. The village was not like most urban neighborhoods. Senate reminded me the other day uh, that Luchow's, the famous German restaurant on Union Square during the middle of the last century, added an open air cafe, but Mayor LaGuardia shut it down as an affront to public morals. A cafe encouraged men and women to loiter in the street, it was determined, and only the destitute and depraved loitered in the street. Luchow's closed in the 1980s, pretty much because nobody went to Union Square any longer. It had become so blighted. The romance of New Yorkers hanging out on their stoops, children playing stickball and running through the showers from open fire hydrants, belies the fact that while there were great hubs of street life on the Lower East Side and in Times Square and elsewhere, streets were on the whole corridors and not where the middle class dwelled. They were not public spaces as we now think of public space. Public spaces were parks handed down by authorities like Robert Moses, who created nearly 800 of them in New York. Today, we would regard Robert Moses' park program as socialist. It was the contribution of con sociologists like William White to show how people might wish to use parks and streets and sidewalks to index what makes them friendly and attractive urban places. This is not William White, but a man in Bryant Park. And this is Bryant Park now. It took decades to institute the necessary improvements, some of them financed by public-private partnerships, like the park. In a sense, the city and public caught up with Jacobs White and their concepts of a healthy public realm just in time for people to realize how public space was being compromised and cooperated by the neoliberal ruling class, occupied by powerful agencies focusing on security and surveillance, and by private interests exploiting the publicness of public space for profit and advertisement. I would only say about the Koch Theater that um, 
this was a very generous gift of $100 million from David Koch, but the State Theater had been created specifically with the idea that it was a, um, it was a gift of the New, Yorker, the New York State citizens to themselves, and so was called the New York State Theater from the beginning. And Mr. Koch is also financing, uh, paid the $65 million to create the Koch Plaza um, in front of the Metropolitan Museum, which will open soon, uh, pretty much outside his window. So this gets to the heart of agency and authority. Some of the most intriguing examples of, there he is again with his wife, that's the, construction site. Some of the most intriguing examples of political action in public space aren't protests per se, but the reconfiguration of public spaces by people, architects and urban designers included, who've taken matters into their own hands, officially or otherwise. The first example <clears throat> involves an addition to the Ring Road in Cairo, made by residents of Ard Aliwa, a neighborhood bordering that highway. And here you see the Ring Road as it sort of winds through. Sprawl. The highway uh, is a project of Mubarak, uh, Hosni Mubarak, and part of Cairo's disastrous exurbanization, which has insulated many wealthy Egyptians behind the walls of gated communities on the city's outskirts. The proliferation of gated communities is a global phenomenon, perhaps the most disturbing urban trend today. Cities are exploding around the world, as we all know, but many of them in Latin America, India, and China are modeling themselves not after places like Boston or New York or Berlin. They are mimicking American-style gated communities, the antithesis of ur healthy urban growth. The gated residence has become the housing complex of choice in much of the developing world. Its effects, in terms of open space, you might say are akin to uh, the enclosures of agricultural land during the 17th century, which did away with uh, the commons. The trend is accelerating, and you see its effects in Cairo. This is um, a place called uh, Katamiya Heights, which I went to see. And um, they, uh, you have these gated residents with golf courses built, that's Katamiya Heights, built smack in the middle of the desert. Um, Mubarak, pandling, pandering to the elite, focused on highways and sprawl to encourage these developments ignoring public transit and public spaces. And in addition to the Ring Road, he commissioned the 6th of October Bridge and Causeway linking Tahrir Square, downtown commercial area, with affluent suburbs like Nasr City and New Cairo, <clears throat> in a country where only 14% of the population owns cars and where more than 20 million people have almost no green space. Mubarak envisioned modern Cairo as a Middle Eastern version, essentially, of post-war America with freeways, automobiles, and class exodus from a festering city center. So it was natural that the 6th of October bridge became a site of violent clashes between protesters and government forces during the revolution. But something even more dramatic, I think, happened after Mubarak's fall and during the purgatory, you might say, of Morsi's aborted rule. Post-revolution Kyrenes, whose neighborhoods had been ignored by Mubarak and bypassed by his highways, constructed their own public spaces. In Mbebe, a neighborhood sometimes nicknamed the Islamic Republic of Mbebe, with a population larger than Manhattan's, residents formed popular committees, neighborhood coalitions, and these committees pooled resources to fix roads that were untended, organize trash collection, enhance public squares, and police the streets. And this is actually a neighborhood committee taking over an area in Mbebe. May al-Ibrashi, uh, an Egyptian architect uh, with whom I spoke about um, guerrilla urbanism in Cairo, this was before the military takeover, told me, what's definitely changed is that before in Cairo, someone always used to dictate where you were allowed to sit and walk, what you were allowed to do or say. This new right to express yourself in the street is not minor or a luxury. The street was not really public space. Now it is. And I saw this nowhere more clearly illustrated than on the Ring Road, which was built specifically to bypass and thereby isolate Ard Aliwa, which, like Mbebe, is an immense informal settlement. For years, workers, including government workers living there in, in Ard Aliwa, had to waste hours every day getting to jobs downtown because they couldn't take the road. So 
In the absence of either help or interference by Morsi's government, residents constructed their own on and off ramps to the highway. They built these ramps out of dirt, sand, and trash, and then they invited the police to open a kiosk at the interchange, which the police did. It was full-on, do-it-yourself infrastructure, a massive assertion of genuine public authority over public space and, of course, an implicit rejection of exclusionary politics. As Omar Nagati, also an Egyptian architect and planner, put it to me, this was again before the military takeover, this was always a revolution, he said, about unjust urban conditions and about public space. The ramp is just one example. People realized they had to determine what happens on their own streets to their own neighborhoods. So, he said, they erupted a battle of ownership throughout Egypt over whose space this is and who determines whose space it is. That's also what uh, has happened in Caracas with the Torre David, an unfinished and abandoned 45-story office building from the early 1990s in the former central business district of the city, which has famously become the, imp the improvised home for more than 750 families. Those of you who are architects in the room might know of this. They've created, in effect, a vertical squat. A team of architects based in Zurich, which calls itself Urban Think Tank, has been studying the tower for years and sees in it the enormous potential for experimentation and creative reuse that characterizes most informal settlements. I would say this is true. Residents of the David Tower have created essentially a mixed-use development um, with electricity, a kind of Rube Goldbergian uh, water system, uh, security, uh, grocery stores, uh, office supply stores, uh, hairdressers, tailors, um, a uh, basketball court uh, with teams that play in local leagues, um, a gym, and an evangelical church around which the building's uh, centralized system of governance has arisen. What had been an ad hoc adaptation to a site has increasingly become regulated redesign. Squatters use brick tiles and other found materials to demarcate apartments and rooms, um, bringing really vernacular styles of uh, arched doorways, interior windows, and uh, neo-colonial architecture, all sorts of uh, things that they have seen elsewhere, too, uh, often in the barrios, but bring this to a glass and concrete uh, unfinished modern office tower. This adaptive reuse, reclaiming what is a kind of disused public space, is um, a microcosm of the megacity itself, is urban think tank points out, um, as a site for reordering the social metric. The residents, unencumbered by principles of design, this is a quote by Urban Think Tank, theories of aesthetics or the received wisdom of the past, build what makes sense to them. They go on to uh, say, if this is the future, if Torre David is the informal city writ small, architects and ur urban planners face a major challenge. Who and what are we to those we serve? What exactly are we designing and to what end? That's all urban think tank. And the group partly tries to answer that question by proposing to put wind turbines on top of the tower and create a kind of pulley system that would cheaply transport goods and people up and down a tall uh, shaft in the absence of elevators because there are no working elevators in the building. But there's a more, I think, evolved answer in the form of a project for a refugee camp in Fawad in the southern West Bank, and I will end with this example, and I'm very anxious and happy to take any questions and comments. Two architects, Alessandro Petty and Sandy Hillal, worked with residents of the Fawad camp to create a public plaza, virtually unheard of in such places, and especially problematic among Palestinian refugees for whom the creation of any permanent amenity by establishing normalcy undermines their fundamental self-image as temporary occupants with the right of return to homes in Israel. We see from this and everything else I've mentioned today, the notion of being in public is a behavioral, not just a spatial condition, which nonetheless depends on certain spatial aspects. In refugee camps, public and private do not exist conceptually as they do elsewhere. 
property is neither public nor private in the camps. Refugees do not own their homes, uh, nor are streets municipal properties as they are in cities because refugees are not citizens and the camp is not a city. The legal notion of the refugee camp, according to the United Nations, is in effect a temporary site for displaced stateless individuals, not a civic body. There is no municipality to care for lights and garbage, other things and concepts like inside and outside are blurred in a place like Fawad. A mother may not wear the veil in the camp, whether she's at home or out on the street, but she will wear it when she leaves the camp, which is outside. So there is a powerful sense of community. And six years ago, Petty and Hilal began a conversation with residents about creating a public plaza or square. The residents were suspicious, not just about normalizing the camp, but about creating a space where men and women might come together in public. Petty and Hilal consulted groups of women, and Petty has described the discussions as two-way, not just architects passively listening to what the women said, but themselves trying to envision what the women might want and what everyone could use. The question was how to make a space that could be open so that men and women would gather together while allowing the women some enclosure. They didn't want to feel exposed where they might be criticized or made uncomfortable. The plaza needed a filter, clearly an edge. So it was decided that the space, a site of about 50 by 100 meters, where there were three disused shelters from the 1950s that needed to be removed anyway, that it was decided they should not be completely open. A wall was devised. The architects interviewed residents whose homes faced the plaza site and negotiated with each one separately the permeability of the wall in front of their houses. So the surrounding wall is here, but where it meets some of the houses, um, each resident could say how open or closed they wanted the wall to be to face the plaza. At a cost of about $300,000 for demolition and construction, um, the, uh, the architects created this limestone plaza with stones, uh, with stone and brick walls. Um, I should say the cost was high and the material of uh, using stone was used because the residents also became very much committed to creating something that really looked um, permanent and that was unlike the rest of the camp, someplace that spoke to them, to, spoke to their aspirations um, and to their ambitions uh, for uh, the community. So more money was um, found and spent to create something that looked uh, better. But in effect, what was created was a house without a roof and this was to address the women's problems. The idea of a house without a roof redefines public space as a space for collective privacy and ownership. The plaza is akin, in a sense, to the camp in making ambiguous the distinction between inside and outside. Women use it without being criticized now for not being home. The site has fostered uh, various activities, meetings, children play there. Um, it's a refuge from the overcrowded streets, and I don't think one can uh, underestimate what this means to get off the streets of the refugee camps and find a place of, uh, to, to gather that's not in one's own home. An older resident of Fawad recalling a former life in cities where Palestinian culture happened outside has said, we didn't have any adequate space where we could sit without feeling that we were basically sitting in the streets and blocking traffic. I think that the plaza is giving us the possibility to recreate our culture of using outside spaces. We can design public spaces that represent us in our diversity. Can we design spaces specifically for protest? I don't think so. And what does protest yield? Egypt has become a military dictatorship. Well, I think it's maybe still too early to say that Tahrir had no impact since democratic revolutions are messy required generations to play out. Occupy had the effect of making concepts like the 1% part of everyday speech, which instantly contributed to Mayor Bill de Blasio's election victory with its tale of two cities. I suspect most politicians and private developers took away from the Occupy movement that in future, they need to work harder to design spaces that can't be occupied. But I think another lesson is that millions of people 
dream of opportunity and equality, and that those dreams will continue to be contested and expressed in the public spaces we build for each other and for ourselves. Thanks very much. Thanks. You started out with, with an architect saying very gloomy things about, about the responsibility of architects. You ended with, with the Zurich group saying the opposite. And, and I'm wondering, yeah. uh, what is the play of, of, of the architects who stand behind the development, specifically in New York City, of this, yeah. these extraordinary kind of, as you said, neoliberal kind of spectacles yeah. of, of these huge towers? Is there, is there any sense of this responsibility coming to, coming to roost, coming home to roost in the United States? Yeah. You know, I should say very clearly at the beginning that, you know, obviously architects don't, they're not responsible for um, everything. And, uh, and architects also, you know, we, we need, I, I didn't mean to suggest that we don't need luxury apartment buildings or, or places for uh, people to, um, uh, places of beauty and, uh, or stadiums or, or arenas or whatever. Um, I think it's a complicated problem because I think a lot of it has to do with the question of, um, that's now arisen, I think, more acutely within the architectural community. How, how do what is the responsibility of architects and how is, that, how is their role um, uh, legislated? Um, I, it's my impression that architects, in a certain sense, sacrifice some of the um, uh, responsibility that they had years ago, partly because there was a public reaction against um, uh, certain kinds of urban plans and uh, the 50s, the sort of whole the reimagining of, of cities and suburbs that uh, essentially limited architects' roles. They, they, you know, they, have a, they have their fee and they do their thing and for litigation reasons as well, it doesn't extend beyond that. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of things going on. I think there is a conversation taking place within the world of architecture that has a lot to do with, as it should, about formal and material possibilities. Um, but I also think that it's, uh, it is incumbent upon architects to um, discuss the question of how they function within the society they are helping to create. To see these buildings, as I tried to say here, these buildings as spaces, as not just simply objects, but as places that are affected by and affect the people who use them. And um, I think this, is an, this needs to evolve because there, my impression, I'm not an architect, my impression is that there's a, still a kind of um, opposition created, a false opposition created between those people who want to become Zaha Hadid and get to design fancy big buildings like this uh, and those people who sort of say they want to do good works. And the people who do the one kind of think that the people doing the other aren't really doing architecture. And the people doing this, um, I think, also feel somehow that they are not uh, respected by the people doing architecture. That, that, I think that's an evolving conversation. I think that will change. Some of it I see as my own small role, and that is where the spotlight turns tends to be where um, money, power, and interests congregate. So if you only focus on one kind of uh, architectural project, then, um, and if that happens to be the sort of towers you're describing, then those will um, continue to be things that people will think are rewarded. Um, the, let me just say one other thing about the 57th Street developments. I mean, I think, um, I think it's a good question whether architects involved in these projects um, uh, are, should, I, I think the architects need to be able to answer questions. Uh, like, how does that building, what is, the, what is the payoff for the public at large for that building? Um, what, you know, it, what, what is the building demanding of the city around it? And what is it giving in return? There, there are different ways that it can be answered, and some of those can be answered by the beauty of the building. Um, but the architect should have answers to those questions, even if they're not originally responsible. Otherwise, I can't imagine taking on such a project. And one of the issues that comes up in relation to that is uh, if you're demanding space um, that is very conspicuous on the skyline, then in a certain sense you're, you're not just taking up the space that you occupy or even the space casting a shadow, uh, 
but the, a larger space in the, in the city itself. And there are cities uh, like London um, which do consider view corridors and the ways in which we protect uh, the, the view. I mean, this is going to create, I, when I wrote about these, I mentioned this, it's sort of like a chessboard in which the original buildings along Central Park South are the pawns, but now these giant buildings will rise be, beyond it. And that does change the city itself. Um, so I, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of issues that relate to, to the public responsibility here, which at least architects should begin to try to answer. And some of the ones who work in those projects, of course, do have answers for that. Yeah, Peggy. Continue that conversation because I think it's complicated. It, it's not my question, but let me just do. I, I do think that architects tend to think that they're getting the scraps, um, that they're not players at the table to make those choices, and we're just trying to get any work whatsoever. And right. if it happens to be really tall and really big, great. But but it, and I'm not trying to in any way justify that. But I think it, it feels we feel disempowered and hence not at the table for that kind of discussion. We right. should. Right. We but should I, be. But and let me just interrupt to say to, to clarify this. So I, I of course this is this is true. But the projects that I mentioned, like the ones that they're doing in in the West Bank, and we can think of others like um, you know Mass doing the pro the hospital project in. Uh, I mean there there are ways in which architects can take can get to the table by taking an initiative and taking on projects that you can't just create a project that's a hundred and, you know 1500 story tower on 57th street but you can create other projects it depends on what kind of projects you're talking yeah. about right yeah and it really does mean looking for the work you want to do as opposed to the work that's handed to you absolutely yeah. um the question that i did want to ask uh, had to do with uh your emphasis on public spaces being um, our right and not something that is a gift that's handed yeah. to us. Um, and I think that lingered in your conversation about streets, too, and particularly in Cairo, that, um, that in some way when they took back the streets or, or found public space, that it wasn't just that they were taking something that hadn't been theirs, but originally had been theirs, and it was, it was their right to reclaim it in some way. Right. So I'm curious to know for all the different places that you've been, whether, when, whether you feel confident to say that that is a condition of streets and, and public spaces, or whether the particular economic, historical, cultural conditions actually does vary such that one would have to modify that claim, or that those modifications don't help the... <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think, I, look, I, I do think it varies from place to place. Um, and I guess what I was trying to suggest was that even the notion of the street as a public space in a place like New York is a relatively recent concept. Um, I mean, I, it's a hard, I'm not, I wasn't quite sure, I thought somebody might mention this, I wasn't quite sure of this, but I think it is true that not so long ago people didn't really think of the streets as public space. It's, it's a little complicated because if you look back, let's say, at a photograph of New York City in 1908, what you'll see are very wide sidewalks and a kind of continuum between the street and the sidewalk because you had streetcars, you didn't have many um, uh, automobiles yet. And so there was a feeling that the whole space was kind of pedestrian friendly. Now, did people consider the street public space as we do now? I don't know about that. I think that's a slightly different thing. I think what we are developing is this sense, um, and this is what I was trying to get at, that there is this relationship between the space and the, the, the democracy, the formation of physical space and the, the declaration, demand of, of democratic space that I don't, I don't think has been the, 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 the discourse for a very long period of time. But of course, you know, um, I can't say that that's the, the case everywhere. What I can say, though, is that I, it's probably not coincidental that when protests have happened, they continue to happen in public spaces. I mean, I think there is an instinctive feeling that people need to find uh, this common ground and whether they define it as public space and the demands for public space are related to their own ambitions or not, they somehow understand that the only place where these, the, these issues really uh, are clarified or somehow made physical is in these things called public spaces. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. But I mean, certainly not, you know, the, the, the way people think in Bahrain is different than the way they think in Copenhagen. I mean, there's no, I think there's no, Right. 
See, I don't think there is a notion of the commons in Bahrain, but I do think there were protests and they sought what is, in effect, the closest they've got to a commons to stage it there, which didn't work partly because it was a space that was too easily, um, it, it wasn't the same sort of enclosed stage-like space. It was a space much too easily taken back from them. Um, there really aren't in many of the Gulf states spaces that where you can congregate, and that's on purpose, I think. Yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I really was interested in your idea of how these spaces are misused, right? None of them were designed for protests, and it doesn't seem likely that we're going to see, you know, a bunch of spaces starting to be designed for protests yeah. in the coming years. I don't know that the yeah. architects will ever be hired by the protesters, yeah. by the people, right? So it seems like it'll always be uh, this sort of sense of misinterpretation or misuse uh, that's really essential. And um, anyway, I, I just wanted to mention something. I, I was part of Occupy Oakland, and you know, yeah. it was the most militant of the Occupy movements, but also yeah. the most innovative. And you know, everyone only heard about our riots, but that was one of only like three branches of what was going on there. There were like the mainstream sort of liberals who believed that we just needed to tweak our democracy, and they're there yeah. to sort of speak to power, hoping they'd be heard. Uh, that was the first. Uh, the second was the rioters that you heard, which were like the most extreme, and they, they were very much there for another version of declarative politics. And then there's this sort of third group of people who were interested in self-valorization. So like, it seems like the city uh, is usually deployed as a way of creating capitalist valorization. And, and there's this third group of people who weren't interested so much in confronting power or rioting, uh, but as much as uh, coming into like a shared space and, right. and sharing. Right, right, and, and creating a second economy, something that was not necessarily capitalist. And I wonder if you've found anything like that. Yeah, no, research. I mean, I, I was, thank you for that. I was, I, that's really what I was trying to suggest in these, in these kind of pop-up towns. That was, that was almost universal, which is in itself quite interesting. I mean, even in Gezi, you know, people instantly set up these, uh, as they're, they're kind of propositional uh, democracies. Um, and, you know, in Zuccotti, it was, it, I mean, it, the, it itself became a problem because they were giving away free food and free clothing, and then you know the space essentially got taken over. But I think that's exactly what happened. The, the people enacted these spaces as they imagined a better society to be, without really there being a program to do that. That just seemed like the thing one needed to do. We need to occupy the space. Okay, well, how do we go about doing that? If we're going to sleep here, who's going to sleep where? Who's in charge? And suddenly you begin to evolve this, this space, which is a proposal of what they are talking about. Because after all, much of Occupy was unclear to people. They, I remember people constantly saying, but what is it actually about? What are they, you know, it wasn't like against the war. It wasn't against, you know, it was, what was the thing? And when you went to it, you discovered the thing was what you saw there. The thing was the, 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 the creation of this space. That was what Occupy um, illustrated. So I, I agree with that. And about creating spaces of protest, you know, I think, as I said at the end, I don't, I don't think it's possible. I think it has to do with any space can be occupied, um, but I don't think um, you can really create a useful space of protest. Erdogan's trying to do it, by the way. He's creating on the um, waterfront in the south this sort of huge place for like, which you'd have a military parade or something where if someone put a protest, it would be out of view. And this is, of course, crucial as well to these places that they are in the middle. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, really a follow-up on the last comment, but first a couple of observations. First of all, for those of us in the room, not me, who are not architects, I want to uh, uh, say that what you say so modestly about shining a light in a slightly different direction really can't be underestimated at this point in time. I mean, I think we have seen the cumulative result of now decades of media attention to a certain way of making space and buildings uh, that is far from a monolithic culture, but has been presented as if it was the only culture that's valuable. And I think a lot of us have been very grateful for uh, again, what you state relatively modestly and really assumes enormous importance in encouraging not maybe not my generation, but the next generation to consider the possibilities that are out there. Secondly, Thanks. just a historical note, I think there's a lot of evidence of the kind of public space or at least the signifiers of public space that you've presented today going way, way back, yeah. in, at least in Western history. 
when protesters tear up the streets in early 19th century Paris to make barricades, right. um, that is uh, a conspicuous form of occupation and of stating the public availability of that space for alternate ways of expressing power. And there are countless examples of that from parades to feasts of fools in the Middle Ages, you name right. it. Anyway, Absolutely. Uh, but uh, to the point, I, I, I think that what you have introduced or suggested to me is that space uh, as, a, as a medium for uh, architecture and urbanism needs to also always be balanced by time. Mm. And I, I, I wonder how you feel about that, having looked at these examples, because most of them appear in the way that you present only after a certain period of time. Right. Um, and of course, an architectural contract not only has limits of liability and right. responsibility in space right. that are bounded by a legal, legally constituted site, it also starts at a certain point and stops at a certain point. Right. And some of the most interesting things that happen to what we design happen well after our formal relationship with them is brought to an end. So the notion that an architect can be something like an organic intellectual yeah. and belong to a community, not just serve a community, and that an architect could be around to look at the uses to which their spaces are, are, are put is an important one. The most obvious example, which you know very well, is uh, the occupation of the lower level of Norman Foster's uh, Bank yeah. of Hong right. Kong, Hong Kong. Yeah. by uh, domestics right. on their off day in Hong Kong, which he, of course, never anticipated, right. but which brings that building to life in a way right. that he's happy to take credit for. Yes, I think. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wonder what you think about that and also about uh, uh, the, the implicit message in the last remarks that, that if you can, uh, in a way, uh, learn from what happens in a space and there is a feedback loop built yeah. into it, so that, for example, the explosion of co-working spaces right. in American cities after the Occupy movement, which modeled that sort of cooperative behavior, is, I think, another conspicuous example. Yeah, no, you raise many interesting points. And, um, and in a way, you answered some of your own question. I think this issue of remaining committed is very important. And it's totally outside the general working model. But it came up in. Um, and then I'll get back to co-working spaces. It came up in an interesting way while I was looking at healthcare design, and um, I, which I still haven't gotten around to writing about, but I really want to. And the reason was because I thought, um, in what sense can you pin down in some specific ways the, um, the effectiveness of design? Can you quantify, on some level, uh, design? Is there any, is that, is that a meaningful question to ask? And is there any area in which such a person, such a thing could be done by someone? Um, I, I, when I wrote about Via Verde, the housing project in the South Bronx, I wanted to change the equation of what we considered to be uh, value because I thought instead of a putting in terms of aesthetic value, look in terms of investment um, in the community, which is what architectural excellence was supposed to um, contribute. Um, so in the case of hospital design, I was struck that, uh, you know, there are people who work on such things, who, who look at design, the effect of different kinds of designs on, on patient care. And this is a slightly long-winded answer, but I'll just say to you, for instance, in Princeton, there's a hospital which was designing a new facility, and so had a model room in which they tested out different designs on different patients and refined the design so that when they moved to the new building, they would have what they'd found to be the most effective design. And what they found over the course of more than a year was that patients in the model room um, asked for 45% less pain medication and said that nursing care and the food was 60% better than in the other, than in the normal rooms. So this was an interesting question. And I asked the guy who, you know, was, so what does this mean about the effectiveness of design? And he said, listen, when we build these hospitals, I would like to have architects more involved but I would like them to work on a contingency fee like everybody else here so that they follow up, they do certain things and they are then responsible for the results of those things. So if they build something and say it's going to be, I want to know that the things that are built here will be uh, reduce infections, 
create happier and shorter hospital stays for patients and so forth. Uh, fewer mistakes by, you know, nurses and doctors. If they can prove the fewer, you know, spreading of infections, as I said, if they can produce results that are tangible, I will pay them more money. I mentioned this to a couple of people who are architects in this room, who are architects, some of whom had worked on these things, and I thought to a person, architects would say, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But actually, I'd be interested to know here, to a person, they said to me, well, okay, that sounds kind of interesting, if we really have responsibility. It's just, it's a slightly off answer to you, but it was a question of the extent to which architects can find ways to become more engaged, and I think they should be responsible. If you put up a building and it doesn't work, you should be responsible if it may look beautiful, but if it doesn't work, and I, I could give you a million museum examples, you know, then you should fix it or somebody else should fix it. As for the um, co-worker thing, I just was out in San Francisco, and I'll just say to you, I spent a lot of time going to the new, um, uh, you know, setups for people like Twitter and Yelp and uh, Square and a lot of these. Um, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, but their aesthetic, this thing you're talking about, which arrives out of Occupy, which has this kind of like, we are um, here to make the world better, and we share stuff. So, you know, there's a barista always everywhere, and there's food and common tables, and this too is becoming um, really interestingly uh, uh, standardized. So everybody has Edison bulbs, everybody uses, you know, uh, reclaimed railroad ties, they all look exactly alike. They all have the yoga ball, they all have the, this is the, you know, so this has become the kind of um, version. Of, so I, I think that's something that also is an interesting question, that, the, that to really create spaces that are uh, truly open and flexible, and by the way, they're very um, grim places. I mean, they have this whole cheery kind of stuff with sayings on the walls, you know, about how there's community and, and uh, you know, the company is great. It's, it's really 1984-ish. But in fact, it's very, they're scary places. So I think it's an interesting offshoot that you described, but it, it's already been kind of through design um, regularized. Yeah. Speaking of reclaimed railroad ties, um, the, the notion that uh, a park might be designed for protest, uh, I'm curious what your opinions are. In, one, in my opinion, one of the great uh, uh, public parks created recently, the High Line, yeah. um, how unoccupiable or occupiable is that as a public space? I mean, yeah. It's a linear park. In, in a way, it, one might uh, view that as a park designed not to be occupied, be, as, as a trap. Well, you're saying, you're, so you're saying it's a space that can't be occupied? I, it, perhaps in a way uh, for protest, it might Yeah, have, I think it would be a useless space to, to occupy. That. Yeah, I can't see why you would occupy it. First of all, uh, no one would know you were there. I mean, you're, everyone's on the ground and you're up there. So, and real New Yorkers don't go to the High Line. I mean, so life would go on and there'd be these people up on the, you know, among these very beautiful plantings with great views into the hotel rooms of the, you know, people of the standard and these people paid millions of dollars so that they could be seen walking around their underpants in their apartments, but otherwise no one would know you were there. So I think the High Line is not an effective site. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's the opposite of Zuccotti, right? Zuccotti was down and surrounded. It was really this stage in the round. Um, but the High Line is an interesting space, of course, um, to, I, I mean, I, it's a, it's a remarkable achievement. Um, at the same time, it really is not integrated into the city, and that gets to this point. Um, perhaps I'm saying what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. The idea that perhaps there is conscious, uh, a conscious idea there to, yeah. to preserve it as unoccupiable for protest. Yeah, I mean, I think that's maybe, I don't know if they recurred to them. I think mostly they were just trying to save it from being destroyed, and that was an interesting gamble. I don't know that they imagined that it would be occupied. And now, you know, you, it's so crowded you can't get up there. Who would know you were even occupying it if you were up there? It's just, you know, it's just too big. But it's, but it's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had a question about um, another um, emerging public space that you had written about, which is the public space of a McDonald's or a Starbucks, yeah. and people just hanging out there for hours yeah. and hours upon end. And I was curious, if you 
is it in any way kind of like a possibility in the future for that to be sort of, um, I don't know, encouraged or yeah. something similar to kind of like the percent, the, the percent for art thing, percent for art or even with um, like plazas and things like that. Yeah. I mean, you mean to create coffee shop or, or places like that, which are subsidized? It's a difficult well, thing for me to wrap my head around. Well, let me try to help you for a second. I don't think anybody's going to take, you know, go for a subsidy for McDonald's. But I do think that there are, uh, so public libraries, for instance, in New York, um, are, have been thinking about bringing in coffee shops. Um, partly it's about retail, but it's not entirely about that. It is about the fact that the way people like to be now <laughs> is in that kind of a space. I mean, there are studies that show people are even more effective in their work if they come to work in a coffee shop than they do if they work at an office. So part of these, this great place I'm describing in San Francisco, are trying to replicate a Starbucks. Um, so there, there is, you know, I do think that that is that's a, this very, um, it, there is a possibility of having um, some public spaces incorporate uh, cafes and maybe run them themselves. But I know you're not only talking about cafes. I mean, the thing, interesting thing about the place like McDonald's, which I wrote about in Queens, was it was a default public space for a community of elderly people who didn't weren't given many other alternatives. Um, and that is something I think we don't think about a lot. You know, think about neighborhoods, who occupies them, and what are the alternatives of the people? Who, what, you know, what kind of spaces are afforded them? Um, and what happened there was really, you know, for many of these people walking to the park a mile away was inconceivable. So the coffee shop is the default public space. But maybe more of a question is in regards to, um, you described earlier the difference between presented public space and adapted public space. And I don't know, I mean, to me personally, as I, I'm very much interested in places where blind spots exist, yeah. like whether it was like that mixed bureaucratic language that allowed for Zucati right. like or yeah. homemade off-ramps, right. like that kind of blind spot. Yeah, so in the case of that particular McDonald's, maybe those of you who don't know, I, I wrote about, that maybe some of you have read about this too, there was in, the, um, in Flushing, Queens, where there's a large uh, Chinese community, but a, an older Korean community, um, there was McDonald's where many elderly Koreans would congregate and spend all day over a cup of coffee. And the new manager of that McDonald's told them that they would have to leave after. There is a sign in all these shops that you can stay for 20 minutes. But it hadn't really been enforced. He started to kick them out. They would come back. The police were called in. So they were hauling out these elderly Koreans with walkers. And um, so this became news. And then there was a kind of detente worked out whereby these guys, um, who were very s sweet, but not, uh, you, you know, I mean, they knew what they were doing. And I think that, I think that what works out in a lot of these spaces, it happens in pub uh, privately owned public spaces as well, like um, these at, at the IBM building, the former IBM building on 56th Street in Madison. These kind of, this is a sort of privately owned public space, so there's an indoor, uh, an atrium where you can sit and there's a cafe and so forth. These places are, um, they're more or less successful depending on the quality of the manager and their ability to um, keep them places where people can seek refuge, homeless people, um, but also places that don't become uh, homeless squatter communities. It's a very delicate thing and it's, it's done actually on a human level. It's not legislatable exactly. The legislation allows people to move people out, but the best places tend to be run with a sense of just understanding. That's ultimately what the result is in McDonald's. It's supposed to be a McDonald's. I know it's not quite a direct answer, but it, it can come down to this. It, it, no, no, but it does come down to this very complicated space. Is it public? Is it private? How do we, you know, who negotiates this space? Um, I think McDonald's has benefited a lot by allowing these Koreans to come back in. Yep. I'd like to start off with a quick historical thud and then get to a question. <coughs> the thud is that Luchow's was not on Union Square. It was considerably oh, east yeah. 
and it was right next to the Academy of Music, which was... It was the other... I'm sorry, Latin. what was the restaurant of the name of that wasn't Luchos? It was the... I'm um, sorry? There was another German restaurant that was on Union Square, there forever and ever. I don't recall. Yeah, I mean, it was I this. Old, That's right. I'm, thank you for that. Thank you for that. The, but, que the yeah. question, though, is that architects do learn, and architects are paid and are often the agents of people who build buildings. Yeah. And if architects learn, and they are the agents of people who pay for them, don't you think that the knowledge that's been gathered about the use of public spaces in the past um, for gatherings of the sort we've been talking about, which I think are great, don't you think that they would commission architects, if they do have public spaces, to design them to prevent these kinds of gatherings in the new spaces? Is that an understandable question? Well, I think that, I think that in the beginning of publicly owned these kind of plazas that were created. By the way, I think we need to check on Luchow's. I'm not quite sure you're right. Luchow's moved around. But in any case, um, yeah, but hold on. <laughs> it's OK. Um, say what? Yeah. Luchow's, Luchow's moved a bit, but I don't want to get bogged down in Luchow's. So, um, yeah. Quickly, if I can, is that future public spaces designed by architects for private interests? Right. Will they use the knowledge of what's happened in the past to design public spaces that prevent or make it more difficult? Yeah, but the yeah, but the, 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 but why do those public spaces exist? They exist because the people who are developing, in the case of these previous ones people who are developing these properties were given bonuses by the public. This is a public wow. gift. You are set, we're saying we're allowing you to get an exemption from a zoning rule and to add square footage to your building from which you will accrue millions of extra dollars. In return for this, give something back to the public. Fine, we give you a plaza. So the public needs then to have some say over the quality, maintenance, you know, uh, use of that space. What, no matter what the arc, you know, the, the client, uh, the, the arc, no matter what the uh, developer says. So, yes, I mean, there's, this is about public oversight. I mean, I guess I wanted to say in general that uh, one of the reasons I focus on public space is I think that for architects, it's, it's just such a ripe area for, um, for engagement in a lot of different kinds of projects, which are quite different than uh, just uh, you know, taking on commissions for single buildings. I think it's, a, it's an area that's, um, that is uh, ripe for really interesting design and for, uh, for new models, essentially, of engagement with, with the public and with clients. Yeah. I was just wondering very, very locally if you had any thoughts about <clears throat> the New Haven Green and Occupy New Haven, because as, as you, you well know, yeah. Technically, the green is not owned by the city of New Haven, but by the ancient proprietors. Right. And we had an Occupy New Haven. And I, I don't know if they benefited. Uh, I, I think on some level they might have benefited from yeah, the I'm confusion. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I think there was an occupation in Harvard Yard, right? This was also interesting to me. But I think very few people knew about it because they, the, the yard was then closed off. The green has the advantage of also being open. How, how busy was the occupation in New Haven? Was, it, it was in, intensely busy, um, but it was confined to the yeah. north and the west corner of the green. So, um, I think that's a problem too. You know, as I said, you so, need this concentration so of. It was space. free, but it was not free. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the, the, the feeling that. Yeah, that but I'm sorry, I didn't see it, so yeah. I'm reluctant okay. to, to say. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.